On today's Revolutionizing Activism, we're talking to Sangeeta Strastova, who's coming from the Civic Imagination Project. Now, in order for us to create a better world, we need to be able to imagine it first. Um, and sometimes we're the ones that do that, but how do we do that with bigger populations? How do we do that within popular culture? So people kind of understand what we're talking about. And as my colleague, Steve Duncombe talks about, you know, that these uh, spectacles need to be participatory. They need to be transparent. They need to be, have ways of people, uh, that people can contribute to them. So Sangeeta studies popular culture and stories and, I realized, you know, in my early days as an activist, um, reading media studies and things like that, it's like you kind of get the idea that popular culture is propaganda for capitalism and everything in it is meant to sell you either a product specifically more lately, but also just like this is a normal way of life um, and, and, and normalizing uh, a capitalist culture. And yeah, it does that. But it also gives us stories that help us make sense of the world, right? And I think everybody knows about, and Sangeeta mentions it in this talk, about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and how many stories are uh, involved that. There's that. Um, but one of the things that I took away from this is that there's this story that's told in you know, the text, in the movie, the script, and then there's the story that people add to it, that it's always in flux, that audiences actually attach meaning and extend meaning. And that gives us a chance to use popular culture to build from. So we're not stuck with the story as it is. And in fact, it's never as it is written, right? Like we are always bringing things to it and the, our culture is always attaching and, and building stories around the, the narratives that we're told. And narratives are how we make sense of the world, right? We are sort of story-making machines. So um, this talk is exciting. It's, um, I hope you get something from it. And um, we have, I think this is a two-parter this time. So we're gonna talk to someone else. I'll keep it a surprise, but enjoy. So um, can you just like give some background on maybe like how you got to where you are now. I know that that can be like a whole lifetime, but um, you know, like what led you to where you are now? What's the research you're doing? Um, so I guess the current journey, the, the journey of my current chapter really begins when I met Henry Jenkins, now my colleague uh -huh, at uh -huh. MIT as a student many mm -hmm. years ago. Now I, I, I will not say how many because that ages me, but it's many, many years. We were actually, we joke about it. We've really, we almost, professionally complete each other's sentences because we've worked together for so mm. long. And he really kind of allowed me or gave me permission at that time to look into spaces where people were engaging and where people cared about what they were doing that seemed, you know, from a sort of traditional standpoint, trivial. So places where people were dancing together or knitting together, or they love to talk about shows. And I, I really embrace that. I mean, in Henry's work, that would be participatory cultures and looking at fandom and where people are really just having fun with each other in informal ways and taking mm -hmm. that seriously, taking that space, those spaces seriously and understanding what they were doing, why they were there, why they care to show up week after week to have these conversations or to dance together <laughs> or whatever they were going to do. And how the t bonds that they then made there could needed to be valued in and of themselves um, and mm -hmm. that they were in some ways the ties that you know tie civil civil society together and kind of going back to what i said about hevel it's in those spaces where that hope is kept alive and then also then moving forward thinking about the ways in which these moments tip into some other kind of action. And now this brings me to the current work around the Civic Imagination Project. We're really interested. I mean, this is not unusual in any way in terms of like people have said this before, but you know, stories move us, st stories animate us. We grew up with stories. Stories are how we make sense of the world in many ways. Um, and I think the sort of original or maybe hopefully somewhat original thought that we have around it is one that these stories for us in today 
are, are by and large drawn from popular culture. Um, and that that is a mix of what you would understand as sort of mass produced culture. So sort of like the entertainment industry, so to speak, you know, thinking about superheroes or big production show movies, but also the small stories that people tell and then they rework the, the sort of folk tales they might rework or religious narratives that they grew up with, but they're kind of playing with. And it all mixes together to create kind of the way the stories that now animate our world. And then for us, the, the key element, because we're so committed to participation and fandom at its core, we see our the peoples and our collective interactions with these stories as a very active process, right? So mm -hmm. um, there, it's not, it's not about, I guess we're, we do sometimes do, let's say, content analysis, where we look at you know, a medium and a piece of a story and we look at what's happening, but we're much more, or at least I will speak for myself, I am much more interested in what people are doing with those stories, how they're making sense of them, how they're talking to each other about them. And then, of course, when you bring in the digital media space, you know, or social media space, you start, you really have an opportunity to witness that kind of interaction between people. Um, so that is really kind of at its core. And then the sort of different tendrils that you were describing kind of sprawl from that because we are interested in the ways in which those kinds of processes can be translate into learning opportunities. We're interested in the, in the ways that those kinds of processes can translate into civic engagement. Um, and just, we, we kind of, we, we look at our, how they can actually help storytellers tell stories better under, mm -hmm. uh, if they understand what's going on on the reception side. It's more than just like receiving a message from, say a popular tv show like you're talking about how that 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 it's not just a one-way thing that it once it's received it can be interpreted it can the meaning can change or there and then there's even interactions that can happen yeah i, I can give you an example i mean uh, uh, i don't i had been i'm thinking about harry potter i know it's a little bit dated in terms of an example because harry potter has been around for a while so i've been thinking about harry potter a lot and it's in fact one of the ways that one of the key story worlds, as we say, that informed yeah. what I'm talking about, because and it, you know when when we were, I guess we had the privilege of starting this work. The books had been written, uh, but the movies were coming out, which is some time ago now, and so we were able to see how people were engaging with the story. What was really a popular thing, and um, what we what I'm talking about really comes into play there. So you have the stories of you know Harry Potter. And then you have all the sense that people made of it as they received it. Um, be it critical, I know some people, and of course with all the controversy and um, issues around what J.K. Rowling has said recently, it's been very critical, but it also was a sort of reworking with love of the narrative. And so making the connections to real world issues, um, thinking mm -hmm. about uh, enslavement of the house elves and thinking about it that in context of child labor, for example, or is Voldemort climate change? And, um, you know, thinking about, of course, the, the, the layering of meaning that happens with the houses that still continues, like which house are you? And it's still, I mean, this, it's so, in a way, it's such a, it's been around for so long now and it still comes up, right? People still say, oh, I was this house. And especially for, let's say the, aging population that encountered Harry Potter earlier, it's still a thing. Like everybody has that, everybody knows their house. And it's those kinds of, like the kind of play with the content that I'm talking about in the in the context of the stories that, you know, are produced for us and we, and we engage with them. So we're very interested in that. And then of course it tips all the way into fan activism in the sense that then some people who love the show get organized because they feel like they actually through their collective love of the narrative have some rights over the story, right? So they want to yeah. either speak directly to the producers to say, you know, don't cancel our show, don't write certain characters out. So there's that kind of activism. And then there's the sort of the activating of the narratives towards real world issues, like what I was describing with Harry Potter um, and, the, yeah. what, and the group that was called the Harry Potter Alliance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um I have a friend, Kenyatta Cheese, who um, I forget the company that he started, but they organize fan communities. And so, you know, there's like times when it happens spontaneously within them and they make the connections. But um, 
you know, he sets up these on like online forums and works for the BBC and, mm -hmm. you know, helps them organize around Doctor Who or something. Mm -hmm. And they're learning all these skills about like how to make their own fan art for this. But the thing, and I'm, I hope I'm um, kind of describing this in a fair way that Kenyatta would agree with, but like, this is what I understand that he does is like, looks for like moments. So all these people have these ideas in common, they have these skills. And then there'll be these moments where it's like, okay, you know how to make this stuff. And, and there's this issue that's happening right now. And this, uh, this aligns with like the values of Doctor Who. So let's apply that to this campaign. And we'll kind of nudge it in that direction. Right. I think the way that I, I kind of make sense of that, um, to, to not be surprised by it in a way, to, to the way that we think about that so that it's not surprising, is to think about let's let's take the story of Doctor Who or, you know, Harry Potter, to think about it as a world as opposed to as a yeah. narrative. Um, and that a story world in which multiple strands exist, right? So you have the, let's, you could, in this context, let's stick with Harry Potter since I think it's the one that many sure. people will be familiar with. Yeah. Like in that context, you have the main narrative, which is Harry's journey and his friends and the battle against Voldemort and so on and so forth. And then you have, even within the narrative itself, you have these sprawling subcontexts, like, you know, um, what's Hagrid's story? What's Dumbledore's story, right? You have these other sub stories that can be, that of course within the fan communities get reworked and rewritten and they ponder mm -hmm. on about the things that people that maybe were not explaining the story and they fill in the narrative gaps. So you have the sort of working with the narrative, but if you take it even one step further, you kind of expand out, you can think about story worlds as the ways in which the imagine our, our, our sort of Im the way our imagination as it's engaged with the stories, with this story makes connections to the real world, right? If you think about like where is that in my real world? Where is that showing up? Where is that relationship showing up? Where is that issue showing up? And you know, that's that's just I think when I think about fans who don't even tip into activism, that's how we often talk about shows, right? That we connect to. And so it's just yeah. actually it's just one step to think about taking action around those issues because we're set up to or we actually are already making those connections explicit. Yeah, like I can't help but think of a show from a similar time period, which was The Wire, mm -hmm. which like, you know, huge for adults, right? Of like, you see this thing and it's like, oh, where is this happening in my city? Like what what's happening in the education system in my city? How does that work? You know, and like mm -hmm. kind of taking that lens and looking at the rest of the world through that lens. Yeah, exactly. And it's not that you're um, you're not you're passively somehow doing this, you know, not yet. It's not like you're expect you're engaging with the content, not accepting it necessarily as like the truth or anything like that, yeah. because that would be propaganda. Right. So that's not what that's, that's exactly the opposite of what we're talking about. So, you know, in thinking about that as an active relationship um, is really, it's at the core of what we talk about. Right. Right. Um, so you, did this study around uh, students doing Bollywood dance competitions? Yes. I don't really know a lot about this. Were th was this like people in the U.S., like college students that decided to take this on or like how did it work? I'm very interested in the ways that these experience, what I'm talking about is actually then connected to our embodied presence. I mean, we're sitting here on the you know, it, on a on a call that you know, could feel very disembodied, but actually, I'm sitting in my body, right? As are you, yeah. and our bodies are are kind of communicating because we have the video, and that's why video is so different from just audio, and so on and so forth. So I was I was really interested in that, and Bollywood, um, as it's known, sort of the the industry that originates in Mumbai with the films that have a lot of musical numbers in it, um, is a phenomenon that is in some ways maps so beautifully onto some of the media transitions that we talk about. So the transition to from analog to digital to more participatory, um, user generated content and so on and so forth. And it also maps in onto um, fandom because these are the Bollywood dancers that I look at are not the ones that are necessarily affiliated with the industry, but they're fans who manifest their love of the, of the genre by performing it and they're incredibly organized around the world. So it's, it manifests fandom. And then in certain moments, it, it becomes about political statements making, and in for, for Bollywood specifically, it's about taking the choreography 
that they see in the films and reworking it and making it their own. That's very much part of the genre practice. So yes, there might be some, um, some of the sort of understanding of the, of the genre and learning some of the moves that are in the films and so on and so forth, but really at its core, and when I was looking at it, it was about reinterpreting that so that it, it is situated in the reality, in the local reality. So it, it's, well, a, it's a certain process like a of remixing or... creation. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you, how does that sort of, how does that end up with a political outcome? Like, mm -hmm. are, are they kind of expressing things through the dance or is it like, I'm, how do they make that connection? Yeah, so it depends on the different, I can give you two examples and I want to be clear mm -hmm. that a lot of, you know, we've been talking a lot about a lot of the um, phenomena and ex ex examples in the context of um, advocating for issues that I guess collectively I will assume we would you know support but I also want to be clear that a lot of the participatory practices that I'm talking about can can they can span the political spectrum right so Bollywood is actually a case in point for this so the two examples that I would um, that I will mention one took place at a college so there's college level competitions of this and these teams from colleges oh. compete and there was one that happened a few years ago where the team came out and they staged the the, the dance often there's a small narrative within it you know because there's a lot of narrative storytelling within bollywood dance and um it was about a young man coming out as gay in the context of his mother wanting him to get married to the girl next door. And, and it was just the whole process of him understand, unpacking that, understanding that, telling his future fiance that this is the situation. She comes around and supports him. And so for, you know, a South Asian community that, I mean, spans the political spectrum this was you know like for some people yeah this is totally a no-brainer of course for some was like oh wow this i have never seen this genre kind of, this topic enter this genre for me and it became a topic of discussion um and it was very much a political statement in this con in this particular example the community rallied behind them they ended up winning and you know it was just a it was really held up as this high and proud moment for for that dance community um be clear yeah. like that that they weren't telling a, an existing story they had made that into the story yes they made the story they took different right. elements of dance moves and different clips from different yeah, yeah, yeah. movies and remixed the music re-choreographed it to tell this story great okay 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 got it so yeah. then let's uh, so on the other end of the spectrum when um there was a group i think they're now disbanded but it was Something it, the name was something along the lines of Hindus for Trump um, that was around around 2016, and they put on a Bollywood show, Bollywood themed dance show uh, to support Trump. And in that case, they they um, set up this dance performance again, <laughs> uh, where it was all about a terrorist attack and. Um, you know, the American army having to come in and there was actual like, violence on the stage. And then the American army emerged as victorious, dancing with the American flag to Bollywood moves, right? So you see, wow. again, neither one of these exists in that shape in the original films that they were drawing from, right. but they made it their own and told a new story. Got it, got it, got it. That was um, quite so, Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so how, how does this like lead into the civic imagination project? Right. So I would say kind of, this brings us back to when I started very kind of philosoph philosophically and like the meaning of my life yeah. <laughs> animates me to me, the civic imagination really starts to veer towards connecting all of these dots in terms of what I was describing in terms of practices and then what underlies them. So we were coming off of having just done a multi-year study on, um, the, the ways in which young people were engaging with digital media and popular culture to activate around civic issues. And as we, we had all of these practices identified and we looked at specific movements and so on and so forth, but as we started to talk about it more and really dig deeper into what was underlying these, these practices, it was a kind of storytelling. Now, mind you, a lot of these movements that we were looking at were did not have formal organizations behind them they were networked from the get-go so there wasn't like a headquarters there wasn't like a central org so they were networked so they had the challenge of 
And how do you sustain that? You can you can bring people together in some ways. I mean, we can talk about flash activism and so on and so forth. But to really think about a movement that sustains over time, that's a real challenge when you don't have like a central leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we noticed was that a lot of these movements, they were using stories. They were using storytelling and a participatory mode of storytelling to to imagine their movement into being. And they were doing this again and again and again. And so it was this active process of imagination that helped them, number one, understand who their community was, because they had to, you have to imagine that you're part of it to, right. um, to really have it exist. It helped them imagine what it would become. You have to imagine where you're heading if you're going to actually uh, sustain a movement. You can't just resist because that'll kind of fizzle out mm -hmm. and you'll move on. You need to imagine where you're heading. You have to imagine what the world that you want would be and so on and so forth. And so they were really, imagination was central to what they were doing. And so we started to hone in on that. And we noticed that, I mean, now I feel like we've been doing this for a while and I'm really excited to say that I feel like it's become it's draw, it has gotten more attention recently. But when we were starting, when we were still speaking with the youth at that time, they were like, really? That's like, that's a, that's a valuable part of what we do. <laughs> like, you know, they were, just, oh, wow. they were just, they were so focused on the tactics or the yeah. strategies or the specific digital tools that they were almost like, wait, what? We also do this, this, all this work around the imagination as actually core to who we are. Um, and so we honed in on that and, uh, named it for us as the civic imagination, this process wherein we have to actively imagine together um, in terms of thinking about where we're going, where we came from. Otherwise, how can you actually move forward with issues? So we spent the last eight years um, understanding how the civic imagination connects to what I was talking about with stories that, not, that inspire us. We've looked into how these um, practices might be activated. A lot of our work is actually in the space of developing workshops, developing activities to, um, I mean, I don't, we sometimes say exercise the, the imagination or flex the muscle because it's, yeah. you know, once we move out of elementary school for a lot of us, unless we decide, even if we decide that art is, you know, it'd be kind of art and imagination gets moved to a particular space. And we say that art belongs in civics um, and the act of us engaging artistically. So not just receiving artists' messages, you know, as, as yeah. civic, but us being actively creative is actually very much part of our civic identity. But um, I'm wondering, like, in, so it sounds like looking at fan activism and fandom as a way of getting to people to imagine, I mean, going all the way back to the beginning of what we were talking about of, you know, seeing that another kind of possibility could exist, imagining that it could, and then bringing that into being. What are things that you've seen, like, what do people need to know? How do they, like, what works that you've seen? Well, what works? Um, I think, so for example, I could just kind of describe, maybe the best way to answer this question is to describe some of the, you know, activities that we've developed. Um, so one thing when we walk, even if it's an issue based discussion, so even if it's actually a civic group, we never start with the issue. We never lead with um, we never lead with that. We always look for the human connections and we but and in, even in introductions, we are looking to kind of cut to what is it what are the stories that people have in them not political stories but like the stories that you know mm -hmm. kind of inspire them and so we have for example one activity where we really do ask people to share stories that inspire them um as a way to introduce themselves so mm -hmm. <laughs> they kind of they start these with these stories and then they are invited to sit at a, at a table and come up share the stories at that table that you know there might be um, uh, you know, Harry Potter, Doctor Who, and Malala, right, might be at this table in terms of the stories that inspire us. And then we say, okay, now you all come up with a new story that uses elements from these three stories. You can mix the characters, you could have the, what would the three characters say to each other if we met? What would, um, what might they do together? You know, what, what, what would the story be? So what's happening there are two things. One is that a moment, there are multiple things happening, but several key things. One is that 
we're in a way simplifying the process of accessing creativity because we're helping people get there because we're already giving them a story. They, everybody has a story, so they already feel equipped. From this. So like there's this power in being able to tap into these existing cultures, existing characters, existing stories, um, a way that you can facilitate conversations people might not normally have because they can like do it and be creative through these mm -hmm. existing things. But the other thing is really understanding the, the community and the culture and thinking about it from their perspective. So that you're, cause it, cause it seems kind of delicate, right? Like if you come in, bust in and be like, Hey, you guys, I think you should do this or, um, that, and you're not seen as part of that community or it's just not consistent with what the community would do or pushes it too far. It's, it's not going to work. Right. I, Sometimes a provocation is a good idea. I'm not I'm yeah, sure, sure, sure. What you're saying like is you know Dumbledore being gay, bringing it back to Harry Potter, like that that was that's a provocation, right? And and it worked. It actually really shifted some people's views on marriage equality, for example, like way back then. Mm. Um, so I think it's not that it's just kind of understanding that, understanding what is happening within, the, and that then you just wouldn't be surprised, right? You'd be like, oh, okay, this is. This is why, and this is why we made this choice to do that. And I want to also be clear, like I, you know, I sing the praises of these participatory cultures because I do deeply believe in them and they have limitations. Um, and handling da debate and confrontation, in fact, is one of the limitations that we look at in the space. Yes, mm. absolutely. In fandom, people debate things a lot. But then when we look at these participatory communities where really people are there to support each other and be there for each other and, you know, share, like, again, like they come together to knit, um, but they, but they're really there about kind of being a support group together as they're mm -hmm. sharing something that they love. So they might not want to introduce issues of contention. They may know that they actually have different views on certain political issues, but they don't want to introduce that, right? Because they don't want to break the community. And so that yeah. is, you know, potentially a, um, I mean, depends on your perspective, right? That's like, is it a shortcoming of, the, of this? It's a, it's a characteristic of this practice for sure. So a lot to think about there, a lot to uh, process. How can we use these kinds of narratives in our work? But I think also going back to that idea of participation, right? How do we let the people that we're working with add to the stories? How do we learn the stories that they're telling themselves and attach the kind of vision and the, and the working towards a better world that we're doing to those stories, right? So that they can understand it, so that they can see how they can participate, so they can see what's possible. Um, this Revolutionizing Activism series is one of many. We've talked to a lot of different folks. You can find those other videos. If you like this one, you might like the others. The Center for Artistic Activism is a 5013C nonprofit organization. We're able to do this because of donations from people like you as well as uh, support from Four Doves Foundation and Andrea Soros Columbell. Um, but if you want to give to the center, um, those small amounts, uh, no matter what they are, are meaningful, small and large. And uh, you can go to c4aa.org slash donate and make a contribution to support this kind of work. And um, sign up for our mailing list where we'll announce other talks, other uh, materials we give away all the resources that we make. Um, and so check that out. We'll see you next time.